This is hell. Our correspondent in Sao Paulo, Brazil, Brian Mir, author of Voices of the Brazilian Left, a collection of interviews with Brazil's left. Brian is an editor at Brazil Wire and a freelance writer and producer. Brian also has his own weekly web TV show in Brazil for some big lefty news medium called Brazil 24-7. Brian, during the Brazilian presidential runoff election this past Sunday, you were reporting live for Telesur English from one of the polling sites. In the end, the vote ended up being a pretty much uh, around 55-45 split for the far right's candidate Jair Bolsonaro. The Organization of American States said they were positively impressed with the organization of the Brazilian uh, election process. How fair, and I want you to think about that in as big a terms as possible, how fair was the election from your point of view on Sunday? Well, I'm very surprised with what the OAS said because these elections were neither free nor fair, okay? And there's a list of irregularities that could be made, you know, starting with the fact that the most popular candidate in the election who was uh, predicted in all polls to win in the first round was Luis Inacio Lula da Silva, who was arrested, uh, according to most observers, impartial observers, including Glenn Greenwald, simply to prevent him from running for president, okay? Despite the fact that he was behind bars being held as a political prisoner, he was still legally allowed to run. The Brazilian electoral courts allowed hundreds of other candidates to run who, like Lula, were also facing appeals processes in criminal charges. In the case of Lula, the criminal charge was that he uh, committed an undetermined act of corruption. They couldn't even define what he did, okay? But there were other candidates, such as gubernatorial candidate for Rio de Janeiro, Anthony Garocinho, who was jailed twice for uh, organized crime, ties and uh, illegal vote buying in previous elections. And he's on ch- uh, being charged with fraud right now in his appeals process. He was allowed to run for governor, no problem. So the only candidate who wasn't allowed to run for office because his second appeals process was underway was Luis Inacio Lula da Silva, which is the very definition of the concept of state of exception. You know, when they when they talk about dictatorships and things like that, a state of exception uh, where the rule of law doesn't apply to everybody equally anymore. On top of that, before the first round of the elections, they just decided to strike three million names off of the ballots for not having updated biometric information. And these names were all from very poor communities, most of which were in the northeast where the PT is you know, outperformed Bolsonaro almost everywhere in the election. So they removed three million poor people from the ballots. On top of that, uh, there was a report that came out in Folio do São Paulo, which is like the New York Times of Brazil, maybe a little bit more conservative, even a little bit more conservative than the New York Times. A report came out the week before the, uh, the final runoff election Uh, proving that Bolsonaro's campaign had set up an illegal slush fund, which received corporate and company donations to the tune of five or six times more than his official campaign fund, and that all this money was channeled into illegal operations in the social media. In other words, buying personal data from these tech companies and hiring them to target specific demographic groups with messages of lies and hatred, okay? And because of this, the PDT party, which came in third in the first round, they filed a motion in the electoral courts to cancel the election. Because it wasn't just Bolsonaro who benefited from this. You know, he, he elected 51 congressmen in his tiny little party that only had seven people in office before that. So it, it really screwed up It changed the entire power dynamic of Congress. So they filed to uh, cancel the elections and the PT party filed to cancel Bolsonaro's candidacy. And the electoral court, President Rosa Weber gave a press conference 
flanked by General Sergio Echegoyen, who is now the most powerful man in Brazil, running 16 departments for the federal government, including intelligence and federal police. Um, flanked by Echegoyen, she announced that they didn't want to make a big fuss out of this because the elections were coming up. Now, they're the election court. So now these investigations are underway. You know, but they set it up so they'd only announce the results after the election. At this point, there's no way they're going to cancel the election. I mean, Rosa Weber has gotten death threats. She received death threats. If Bolsonaro didn't win the election, they said they were going to kill her. You know, so the, the, the general impression is that the courts, the electoral court and the Supreme Court are being completely controlled by the military right now. Okay, so, yeah. Well, I was just—I Go was, was just going to say that. Uh, so, I, I think what I'm—I'm I'm learning here about like when you hear these international organizations affirming the credibility of a vote, like an organization like the Organization of America States, American States, it seems like what they might be fo like they're ignoring the uh, situation with Lula, they're ignoring the slush fund, they're ignoring you know the electoral court is they're ignoring their duty. So when groups like the OAS do say, let's see, the quote again is that the vote was positive, they were positively impressed by the organization of the Brazilian election process. Does that just mean that like the mechanics on that specific day, like just focusing on machines and people having access to vote? I'm, I'm trying to figure out why would they make this kind of statement? Are they ignoring bigger factors and they're just focusing on small factors or is it something else? I'm not, you know, I'm not sure, Chuck, I can just speculate, but I will say this, you know, the, the actual mechanics of the Brazilian elections are much more advanced than the U.S. elections. They had the results in for president like half an hour after polls closed. No hanging chads or anything like that. It's all done electronically and each ballot box is unconnected from anything else so that they the risk of being hacked is very, very low. They would have to hack it ballot box by ballot box. So the way to least, so the way to overthrow yeah. or corrupt an election then is to do it in the way that they did. Make certain that their opposition can't run for office, uh, <laughs> give a whole bunch of misleading information to the public. That's the way you corrupt an election nowadays, not through just at the ballot box, correct? Yeah, obviously. I mean, look at... Uh, Look at how Trump got elected. I mean, they compromised ballot, you know, they, they purged poor voters too. But it's basically, it seems like democracy is no longer much of a match for social media technology, really. Because you know, if you can get a large part of percentage of your population believing that global climate change is a hoax, that Jesus used to ride around on dinosaurs, <laughs> and that the earth is flat, imagine what you can do in terms of manipulating people to vote. And we'll get to that manipulation yeah. in a second. On Saturday, when we spoke on air the day prior to Sunday's vote, we were discussing the potential for violence and that you would be bringing security with you when you covered the election live for Telesur English. Were there any reports of political violence when you were reporting from Sao Paulo? Did you see any violence? No, I didn't see any violence. And my security guy turned out to be a complete joke. He was just trying to show me photos of his Tinder dates. You know? <laughs> So it was a joke. I ended up getting rid of him. <laughs> but, <laughs> but uh, you know, uh, there was a lot of violence. Yeah, I didn't see any because I live in a part of Sao Paulo that's mostly PT. You know, so I was, but I was pretty scared because I was in the headquarters of the CUT Labor Union Federation, which is like the AFL-CIO of Brazil, only it's more left, you know. And I was worried that that might be attacked because there were, there were like victory parties with military vehicles driving through them with the military cheering and the police cheering. And there are a lot of uh, fights and things that happened for sure, but I didn't see any of it, luckily. And but I'm going to a protest today. I'm covering a pro, an anti-Bolsonaro protest for Telesur later this afternoon. And they, I hear that at the last pro-Bolsonaro uh, protest, they beat up a reporter from Folio do São Paulo. Wow. So, wow. And what if they find out I'm working for the 
fucking Venezuelans. <laughs> you know? Or worse, that you work for This Is Hell. So at one this point, is, oh God, worse, yeah. at one point, you report that supporters of the first round winner, again the far right uh, wing Jair Bolsonaro, had been flooding social media in Brazil with lies about uh, the left political party, the PT, Workers' Party candidate, Fernando Haddad. And they were spreading rumors that he, even to the point that he was a pedophile on the day of the election. I realize, you know, it's impossible to actually know, to actually quantify if that kind of propaganda had any impact on Sunday's election. But do you have any feeling, in your opinion, do you have any sense of what kind of impact it may have had on the election? Yeah, well, it's, it's not one individual thing. It's the culmination of six months of daily lies like this one. Haddad is a pedophile, right? Daily bombarding millions of people in Brazil with misinformation, with videos that were staged, you know, with uh, photoshopped photos, which is why Marcelo Zero, who is a sociologist here in Brazil, wrote a great article that we published in This Is Hell about, in This Is Hell, no, in Brazil Wire, sorry, about how this operation is just way too sophisticated for a tiny political party to pull off on its own. And it, it looks like it has the stamp of foreign intelligence groups on it, be it governmental or corporate or whatever. But it wasn't, this is obviously something that was orchestrated with a lot of support from the outside. Tell, you know? tell us and, has, been yeah. uh, has been reporting on what Bolsonaro says he will do when he is inaugurated as Brazil's president. And one Report from six days prior to the election, Teleser posted the far-right candidate of the Brazilian election, Jair Bolsonaro, vowed to purge the country of the left-wing political opponents during a video address on Sunday. This is last Sunday, or two Sundays ago. Either they go overseas or they go to jail, Bolsonaro told thousands of cheering supporters who had packed Avenida Paulista, one of Sao Paulo's main arteries, for one of his final campaign acts. And then he said, these red outlaws will be banished from our homeland. It will be a cleanup the likes of which has never been seen in Brazilian history, Bolsonaro declared. How afraid are you of a purge of the political opposition to Jair Bolsonaro once he is in office? Or worse, a pogrom, an organized massacre, as he was quoted back in 1999, saying elections won't change anything in this country. Unfortunately, it will only change on the day that we break out in civil war here and do the job that the military regime didn't do, killing 30 Thousand. If some innocent people die, that's fine. And every war, innocent people die. I will even be happy if I die as long as 30,000 others go with me. So purge, pogrom, what will uh, Bolsonaro's political opponents face now that he has been elected? Yeah, it's. I'm really bumming out about this, really stressing out. I've been living here 23 years. Someone made a meme with my face and Bolsonaro's face in which I was criticizing Bolsonaro that got 10,000 shares on Facebook a couple weeks ago in Brazil. I'm, I'm actually kind of worried. Uh, obviously, though, it's 46 million people voted for the PT. He can't purge 46 million people, you know? But it's this American-style, communist, anti-communist paranoia circa 1963-64 that's taken hold with a large segment of the population now. And this comes from the United States. The CIA trained, gave training to the Brazilian military in the 1950s and 60s to help them change their focus on a foreign enemy to an internal enemy. And so the main modus operandi of them led by General Goldberry during the dictatorship, was to focus all of their energy on this internal enemy. And when they killed, tortured, and arrested all of the left-wing guerrillas and freedom fighters who were fighting the dictatorship, they built this repressive apparatus up so much that they just moved on to other groups. They started killing journalists and labor union people. You know, so And he's putting four people from that era in his government already. So it's pretty worrying, you know, you can say, oh, he's just talking, it's just words. But the problem with words is that even if he doesn't act on them, his millions of neo-fascist followers who are called Bolsa minions in Brazil will, you know, so there's these acts of mob violence. I mean, I have a friend who's a gay friend of mine was walking down the street the other day and he saw a woman just yelling at another gay guy, uh, I bet you're afraid you're going to be killed now. 
You know, so my gay friends are really stressing out about this too. So how and, much uh, then was the how much was the military dictatorship, Brian? How much was it actually dismantled? Well, that's the thing, and this is this brings me to a key point. Uh, after reading years of articles in by American leftists about different failures of the PT and failures of the Brazilian left, I would like to say that the northern left has completely failed Brazil, and they failed it by taking on an ideological blind spot on the question of imperialism and not accurately describing the context within which PT was operating. So if you believe that the U.S. and multinational oil corporations had absolutely nothing to do with the rise of fascism in Brazil, it opens space for you to write these big diatribes about the failure of the left. Oh, they were too neoliberal. They were this, they were that, you know, because you're not you're not talking about the main power actor in the region. And secondly, these kinds of articles, which I've seen in Jacobin, NACLA, The Nation, all kinds of places in the U.S., these articles that try and pin everything as an internal issue without looking at foreign influence, they don't even accurately describe the situation. When the military dictatorship ended in Brazil, there was, they gave full amnesty to everyone. No one was ever arrested for torture or anything like this, right? Secondly, the two official parties of the military dictatorship era were allowed to continue operating and maintained control of Congress and the Senate for decades afterwards. And these two parties are called DEM and MDB. Thirdly, the military police was never demilitarized. So uh, they made a special exception for the military police in that um, they don't respond. If a military police officer kills someone, let's say a kid, because they kill a lot of homeless kids, he doesn't go to a regular court of law. He goes to military court. He's judged by his peers, which is why they keep killing thousands of people every year and none of them ever get punished. All right. So the actual structure of the dictatorship was never fully taken down. And during the 13 years of left rule in Brazil, the, the PT party never had more than 22% of Congress. So they did not have the power to eliminate the military police, although they tried three times. They didn't have the power to, uh, to put former torturers in jail, although Dilma created a truth commission to look into this. You know, uh, they were unable to uh, control the military because they didn't have control of the three branches of government. Really, you know, so I've seen, I saw something very recent even in Jacobin where someone was talking about the failure of the PT to control the Brazilian military. They were operating in a situation where they had they didn't just have the wrath of international capital on them at certain points because they refused to uh, privatize the petroleum reserves. They didn't just have the wrath of the U.S. on them because of their involvement in BRICS, because they decided to buy fighter planes from Sweden instead of Boeing, you know, because uh, they discovered that the U.S. NSA had been spying on them and they got angry. They didn't just have all of those factors against them. They they weren't they didn't have full control of the Brazilian government, you know. And so taking all that into consideration, even though maybe they didn't do they didn't turn into a a real socialist state like Venezuela or Bolivia or something, these countries that were farther left, they managed to get a lot of things done considering the power of their adversaries, you know? And so if you ignore all of that, then it makes it easy to write these little tisk tisk style columns, bad mouthing the Brazilian left at a moment over these last two years when what the Brazilian left really needed was a lot of solidarity because now, it's a shit storm, really, you know, the shit is hitting the going to hit the fan down here. So, and so have a large percentage of American liberals and progressives just think, oh, well, you know, the PT really screwed up. So to you, Brian, what explains the northern left's inability to see the continuing structure and power of the dictatorship, to not see the lack of power of the Workers' Party and to not see foreign intervention. What explains the northern left's inability to see those characteristics of Brazil leading up to this election? 
Well, in terms of foreign intervention, I came of age, as I believe you probably did too, in the 1980s, when everyone knew that the U.S. was shitting all over Nicaragua, El Salvador, Guatemala, and Honduras. And we see the blowback from Honduras right now. Like, if you didn't talk about American influence with the Contras and in Central American stuff, you would be laughed at in the U.S. in the 80s. But I, I don't know what's happened since then, but it seems like a lot of left, traditional left publications have been influenced by corporate foundation funding. So maybe it's this question of, they call it the honeypot of foundation funding, where they don't want to bite the hand that feeds. And so they focus on other things. Maybe people are worried about their careers, worried about getting blacklisted by talking about it, because a lot of people who write for these publications are like PhD students and stuff. And the, the academia in the US is just a mess now. You know, you have to kiss people's butts for 10 years before you can get onto a tenure track anywhere. So people are very timid, you know? But also I think there's a problem with the American left is um, Mark Ames mentioned this to me the other day. I was on that podcast of Radio War Nerd. He was like, one of the reasons that the American left never gets anything done is because they're so they have such a fixation on purity. There's this whole thing about like, I'm more of a pure leftist than you. These leftists are not pure enough. <laughs> you know, they're, they're too conservative. They're not, you know, it's all of this art, internal arguing about who's cooler than each other, really. I think that tarnishes some of the stuff that's been, you know, written on the left. <laughs> I just got one of those US. stupid arguments on social media myself. So during the campaign, <laughs> Bolsonaro also said he approved of torture. When you talk to other members of the Brazilian left and those who support the PT or those who even support uh, CUT, the, uh, tr the workers' union, how much fear is there that they're, they will be potentially tortured? I mean, are you concerned for your own personal safety as someone who vocally and openly opposes Bolsonaro? Do you fear that you and your colleagues and the people who you work with might be the targets of torture? Well, um, I'm afraid for a lot of friends of mine. Yeah, I'm afraid. Like he just said he was going to declare the MST as a terrorist organization. And I worked with the MST for five years and I have a great, enormous respect for the MST, the Landless Workers Movement. They've managed to get, talk about a left organization that actually achieved something. They've gotten They've legalized, they've homesteaded on and legalized farms for 400,000 families, you know, out in the countryside. They're really good. And um, they're going to, if they're declared a terrorist organization, they're already victims of violence in the countryside. Every year, half a dozen of them are killed out in the countryside. And so I'm really worried about them. And I'm worried about other friends in social movements. I have a feeling that I would not be anyone's top priority just because the fact that I'm an American throws some of these Bolsonarians into confusion. Because on the one hand, I'm from the Valhalla, the promised land of the master race, you know, and on the other, I'm criticizing them. So they get a little bit confused. <laughs> but I, I'm, still, I'm still worried uh, for my own personal safety, though. I'm going to take a wait and see attitude for a while and see what it looks like. And I'm actually thinking maybe of having to move out of Brazil after 23 years. Yeah, that would be horrible, dude. So Telesur quoted Jose Roberto de Toledo, a political journalist from the magazine Piaui, I guess, P-I-A-U-I, yeah. saying Bolsonaro's authoritarian rhetoric was an escalation. As Mussolini would say, if you pluck a chicken one feather at a time, people don't notice. To what degree are Brazilians not noticing any slow, pernicious escalation in authoritarianism in Brazil. Well, I'll tell you, it's been happening for a while now, and some of it even began happening when Dilma Rousseff was president because she let people talk her into passing laws that she didn't know were going to be used against her and her followers, you know, like the law a lot admitting plea bargain testimony in courts, which became the main weapon to arrest as many people from PT as possible in the U.S. government-backed operation Lava Jato. You know, so 
the police forces got militarized during the World Cup and the Olympics. You know, and so they got all of this new Israeli and American riot control equipment. The Sao Paulo state government legalized the use of, and this is a conservative government. It's important to know that the, the state governments control the police. So you can't blame uh, specifically like Lula for, for his, what police did in Rio de Janeiro when he was president. Yeah. But they legalized the, in Sao Paulo the use of rubber bullets against protesters. And they, they set up a new anti-protester police division called the Leg Breakers who are all police who are trained in jujitsu to use this kind of like Star Wars stormtrooper style plastic body armor. And then the guy who legalized uh, the rubber bullets for use on protesters in Sao Paulo was nominated to the Supreme Court. So now, and he's, <laughs> so, so you saw things were developing before the coup. After the coup, uh, President Temer reestablished the office of the Cabinet of Presidential Security, which is an office that controls 16 government ministries. And he appointed this General Sergio Echegoyen in charge of it and authorized full military occupation of Rio de Janeiro state. And so you, you can see how this authoritarianism has been creeping up little by little, but a large segment of the population is so brainwashed by social media that they don't even, it seems like they don't even, they're not worrying because it's not them, it's the others who are gonna be killed and tortured. Back in July, Bolsonaro said if he was elected, he would leave the United Nations. Bolsonaro said, if I am president, I will leave the UN. That institution is of no use. I will leave the UN. It's no good. It's a meeting place for communists and people who have no commitment to South America. What does it mean for Brazil and for Brazilians if Brazil does leave the UN, which for all of its good, it is, like any organization, faulted? Well, uh, what it really means is that Brazil has completely abandoned its strategy established by Lula and Celso Amorim, his foreign affairs minister, of trying to in increase and expand Brazil's role on the international stage in an attempt to foment or create this kind of counter hegemony to US imperialist interests. This is why Brazil created the BRICS, right? And um, so the Brazilian government like branched out, was working more with the European Union, was doing business with African countries, Turkey, Iran, China, and um, trying to build or engage, you know, participate in the building of some kind of counter hegemony. And now withdrawing from the UN just means that Brazil is going to take 100% of its orders from the United States. Bolsonaro has already been filmed saluting the American flag. He's a big Trump fan. Go figure. You know. So, so is that's this the, the main. Is this the end of BRICS then, Brian? Well, I have a good friend who's a BRICS critic extraordinaire, Patrick Bond. It looks like Brazil. It looks like Bolsonaro is going to pull the Brazil's. Brazil has degenerated from being a protagonist of the BRICS and the second biggest economy in the BRICS after China. Because when Lula was president, Brazil had a bigger economy than the Soviet Union. I mean, Soviet Union, no, Russia, sorry, geez. I guess I am a communist, Bolsonaro's right. <laughs> <laughs> so it had a, you know, it had a bigger, it was a big economy, it was a big actor in the BRICS since the 2016 coup. Its activities are very minimal within the BRICS. They're, they might show up at the meetings, but they're not doing anything anymore. And the projection is that with this um, spreading of anti-Chinese rhetoric by Bolsonaro now, that he's gonna pull out of the BRICS. And from what I understand from people I know who are really involved in the BRICS, I actually was uh, involved in the formation of the BRICS. I went to some of the early BRICS meetings in Brasilia and in Delhi when I was an NGO uh, director for ActionAid. So I have friends who've been involved in the whole process. And from what I'm told, uh, 
the BRICS these days, it's basically just China calling the shots for everything. It's, it's kind of degenerated into this uh, Chinese tool for Chinese hegemony or something. Yeah. So, Telesur also reported that in 2011, Bolsonaro told Playboy magazine that he would be incapable of loving a homosexual son. And in a 2016 documentary, Bolsonaro claimed that homosexuality had increased over the decades due to liberal habits, drugs, and because women began to work. In 2017, at a speech in Rio de Janeiro, he said that Afro-descendants do nothing. I do not think they even serve as reproducers. Telesur added Bolsonaro also promotes anti-feminist policies and gender inequality. On Sunday, to what extent did racism, homophobia, in misogyny win in Brazil, and how well does Br- Bolsonaro's racism, misogyny, and homophobia reflect the overall feeling of Brazilians on race, gender, and sexual orientation? Well, I feel like his comments are, you know, 100% believed in by maybe 25% of the country. You know, Brazil's always had a racist, very racist streak. Then you have this kind of passive racism, homophobia with another 25%, you know, and the country is 53% Afro-descendant, but a lot of Afro-Brazilians actually voted for Bolsonaro because the level of brainwashing in the social media, it's really just this massive psyops operation that happened. The amount of brainwashing is just out of control. So in the lead up to the elections, every time Bolsonaro appeared on TV, he was like, oh, no, those stories about me aren't true. It's just fake news. I never said that. I love black people. I love women, you know, this kind of stuff. And so I think a lot of people were telling themselves, oh, this was just his rhetoric. He's just a guy who shoots from the hip. He's just saying what he thinks. But that doesn't isn't going to be reflected in any way he acts. But I don't think that's a very good conclusion to draw from that, you know? Uh, the New York Times, uh, they uh, reported, they had a whole bunch of quotes that uh, Bolsonaro had made prior to the election, but they didn't report any of them until the day after the election. And I'm going to go through some of those quotes with you in a bit so we can get your reaction to them. But before we get to those quotes, the Times introduced the reporting by posting, The far-right former army captain's rise has left some baffled. Mr. Bolsonaro served seven consecutive terms in Congress with little to show for his time there. Very few bills, very few of his bills were approved. What does it say to you about the New York Times when they seem to be baffled by Bolsonaro's rise to power? Well, what it shows really is the level of the New York Times complacency in this whole process. You know, they spread all kinds of misinformation about Dilma Rousseff in the lead up to the 2014 elections. Okay, they consistently associated her with corruption in the Petrobras Petroleum Company, the same company that the U.S. government and U.S. petroleum companies have been trying to eliminate, the same company that the uh, the Edward Snowden revealed was being spied on by the NSA. So they consistently dragged the PT party's name through the mud disproportionately and often misleadingly and erroneously associating them with corruption in the same way that Mussolini associated the left with corruption in the 1920s. Okay, so they, their current Latin America desk editor, Juliana Barbosa, was assistant managing editor of America's Quarterly, the magazine run by the very powerful corporate think tank, ASCOA, America's Society Council of the Americas, which has been involved in almost every coup in Latin America since the 60s. She was there when they invited Bolsonaro for closed door meetings with US business leaders. Okay, so if, if she's baffled about why Bolsonaro came to power, She might want to start looking at her own former employer and how they negotiated with Bolsonaro behind doors with business leaders. And I'm just going to speculate here and assume that they influenced Bolsonaro's choice of economics chief 
University of Chicago educated Paulo Guedes, who was an attache for Augusto Pinochet, and is very friendly with the U.S. business community. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to imagine that Bolsonaro's choice of this man was influenced by his meetings with Ascoa, who at the time Juliana Barbosa was working with. So I'm just, I'm confused why the New York Times doesn't understand. <laughs> why are they wringing their hands right now? You know? Yeah. Why are they wringing their hands? They were involved in this. The Times also you know, reported the, that many Brazilians, angered by their country's economic crisis, soaring violence and corruption scandals, interpreted Bolsonaro's long list of caustic remarks as blunt, but bracingly honest talk from a man willing to say and do whatever was necessary to bring about the change they craved. So, in your opinion, who is responsible for the economic crisis, violence, and corruption that the Times describes here? Because from their framing of it, you would think it was all the non-fascists in Brazil who were behind it. Yeah, it's ridiculous. The, the violence crisis in Brazil started during the military dictatorship when the Italian uh, um, Gamor, I guess, or the Calabrian Mafia, one of these three big organized crime groups from Italy started using Brazil as a transport point for exporting coke up to Europe in the early 1980s. That's when violence first started spinning out of control in Brazil. The dictatorship was in charge then. And one of the reasons they lost power was because people were getting fed up with the violence. Okay, so that that method, the neo-fascist method of controlling drug crime doesn't work. All right, we all know that it hasn't worked very well in Colombia either. Um, and um, the the economic crisis was caused by multiple factors. I mean, journalists love to say it's one thing or the other. Uh, Dilma Rousseff made a few mistakes, yes, but it was greatly exacerbated, as the people from CEPR have mentioned. You know, the, the initial crisis was mild. It was an error in calculation of the selic rate, the interest rates in Brazil, com committed by the Dilma Rousseff administration, a slowdown, um, a recession. But it was greatly exacerbated by two factors. One is that immediately after she was elected, the conservative opposition led by the PSDB party deliberately sabotaged her sabotaged her government and and didn't let her pass anything and so it sabotaged the economy and I'm not just like making up this accusation the actual president of the PSDB party apologized for this two months ago he said anything that Dilma tried to do we automatically did the opposite even when it was hurting the country okay so she was unable to push through any kind of adjustments to the economy at a time when a recession was carrying going off. And at the same time, in the same year, 2015, the U.S. Department of Justice backed Lava Jato Operation Car Wash. Uh, instead of treating Brazilian companies as too big to fail, key companies to Brazilian economy, they paralyzed their operations. And so they shut down the construction sector in 2015. They paralyzed all operations of the five largest construction companies in the country for six months, causing 500,000 immediate job losses and all kinds of indirect job losses. So these two other factors greatly exacerbated the, the uh, economic problems, which were even further worsened by the Temer governments doing the absolute stupidest thing that anyone could ever do during a recession which the US always pushes on other countries in the third world, but never does itself, which is slashing government spending during a recession because you're just taking billions of dollars out of circulation. There's no way that slashing spending during a recession ever helps anything. The best way to get out of a recession is what Franklin Delano Roosevelt did. And it's even what the Obama administration did in 2008, which is increasing government spending. <laughs> so they, Brazil was blocked from that, you know? by this coup, this coup government. So it's like it's like a mixture of several factors that have screwed up the economy, but there's no uh, provision whatsoever. There's no there's no idea whatsoever that Bolsonaro has any plan up his sleeve to change the current stagnating economy, because all they're talking about is more austerity cuts. You know, when so when Bolsonaro was named the winner on Sunday, as Telesur reports, Bolsonaro announced that he will not be speaking to the press, but will be making all of his public statements via social media. 
Why not speak to the press? What should that decision reveal to us about Bolsonaro? Well, Bolsonaro says the press is all communist. You know, the press, which orchestrated the coup against Dilma Rousseff, is also communist, just like Dilma Rousseff. They, they were called in the economist communist. And so <laughs> Bolsonaro, <laughs> you know, they're like the communist. <laughs> So Bolsonaro was on TV last night on national news, threatening to shut down the biggest newspaper in Brazil, Folha do São Paulo, which, as I've said before, is like a more conservative version of the New York Times. That's communist to them. But the presidential election wasn't the only vote on Sunday. There were other votes as well for governors, for 54 of the 81 members of the federal Senate and all 513 members of the Chamber of Deputies. So what happened in those elections? Did Bolsonaro's PSL do as well in those elections as they did in the presidential vote? And would it really even make any difference? Because back in 1999, uh, Bolsonaro said, I would perform a coup on the same day I was elected. Congress doesn't work, and I'm sure that at least 90% of the population would celebrate and applaud because it doesn't work. The Congress today is useless. Let's do the coup already. Let's go straight to the dictatorship. So no matter how well this, uh, the left did, the PT did, in, and his opposition, political opposition in general did, in the Senate and chamber elections, would it make any difference if they did well? Well, that's several questions wrapped up in one. Exactly. With a historic quote. <laughs> uh, first of all, uh, these were just gubernatorial runoff elections along with the presidential election. And the left, you know, did really well in the Northeast. The Northeast of Brazil is like a leftist colony inside the rest of the country. There's only one state in the Northeast that isn't being run by a PT or a communist party governor right now. And since the governors control the police, there's a feeling that that's the type of place that it might be safer to live in after Bolsonaro takes the presidency. Uh, regarding his threat to shut down Congress, his party just gained 51 seats in Congress. So I'm not sure if he would really want to put all of his friends and supporters out of work. But the real issue here is who's really running the show? Bolsonaro is not, the military is just not going to sit back and let a former captain who was kicked out of the military for planting a bomb in a military barracks to protest captain's salaries or something. You know, they're not going to let a captain boss them around, probably. You know, they're these guys. Bolsonaro is not very intelligent. You know, and some of these people in the military are very intelligent and, you know, know a lot more about how things work. Bolsonaro doesn't understand economics at all. He doesn't know. He doesn't even understand conservative economics. And um, so the, the question is, does the military want to do these kinds of things he's threatening? And apparently there's a already fighting inside of his economic team because the military doesn't necessarily agree with the neoliberal direction that Paulo Gates wants to take the country in. If you look at how the military dictatorship operated economically, they were concerned. They had some neoliberal elements, of course. They privatized some things, but they had a strong current of kind of like Nixonian conservative Keynesianism, with some elements of nationalism and you know trying to maintain some kind of sovereignty for the country. So that there seems to be some arguments already going on. And it's hard to say, they say Bolsonaro's going in for surgery and he's going to turn the country over to his vice president, General Morão, for a couple of weeks after he takes office. And if that happens, it'll be interesting to see if they let him come back. There were, of course, comments made on social media that Fernando Haddad was a communist. The communist is the red herring that they really beat people up with a lot in Brazil, as I've seen through posts that when we've uh, shared your interviews online and we've seen the comments that people have left in Portuguese, communist is often a slur that they use and as they've used against you as well. But Fernando Haddad's vice presidential candidate was Communist Party member Manuela de Vila, according to an article I saw, I think it was either the Times or Telesar, I can't remember where I saw it. Bolsonaro warned Haddad 
was a communist. So how communist was or is Haddad because he selected a communist party member, Manuela Davila, to be her, his vice presidential candidate? Well, the, the PC to be is communist in name. In practice, it's social democratic, really. You know, it's not, they, but they have their roots in armed, you know, armed guerrilla army resistance to the Brazilian dictatorship. So a lot of, a lot of people in the military do not like them, but they're, they've really swung towards the center. What, what's happened in Brazil really is that right wing parties stole a lot of the left wing party names. So like the, the Social Democrat Party in Brazil is a right wing party. It's a neoliberal party. So other parties take, you know, I would I would say ideologically the PC to be is social democrat now. There might be a few old timers who still believe in communism in there. However, you know, the fact that she's officially associated with the Communist Party, she was the first communist party member to run for president or vice president of brazil since the 1940s i'm i'm worried about her you know and she's really cool too she's a really cool person this past sunday did democracy die in brazil was it killed by the democratic will of the people of brazil did brazil vote against democracy democracy died in 2016 when the u.s government and international capital supported the overthrow of a democratically elected president, Dilma Rousseff, over a non-impeachable budgetary infraction that was legalized one week after she left office. And the new coup government, which is now being referred to as the Weimar Republic of Brazil, 21st century Brazil, started doing everything that the US wanted it to. That's when democracy really died. Finally, Brian, Bolsonaro has made pledges against the indigenous living in the Amazon, the people who you were saying were being protected and represented by the MST. Bolsonaro has said, we are going to fuse together the Ministry of Agriculture with the Ministry of the Environment. We need to put a stop to the demarcation of indigenous land. Indigenous people want to rent out the land. They want to be able to do business. They want electricity, a dentist to remove the stumps of teeth from their mouths. Indigenous people are human beings like us. They don't want to be used for political purposes. Our Amazon is like a child with chicken pox. Every dot you see is an indigenous reservation. And the Brazilian people applaud demarcation of indigenous land. Look at these people. No political strategy. You told us on Saturday, the day before Bolsonaro's election, that he was was a threat to the Amazon in general, not only the indigenous people who live there. To what degree was Brazil's vote dangerous for the entire planet and for the planet's climate? Yeah, uh, pretty dangerous for the climate. And obviously, when he talks about kicking all of the indigenous people off their land, he wants to cut down the trees. You know, in, so, in some places, the only on the edge of what used to be the Amazon jungle, the only forest left is on the indigenous reservations. So he's talking about cutting down all the trees, kicking all the Indians off their indigenous people off their land, converting them all to evangelical Christianity, you know, so that they can work in the service sector in the cities and lose all of their cultural identity. That's his plan. And yeah, it's pull, he's talking about pulling out of the Paris Accord. And, um, you know, the PT party didn't have the greatest environmental record in the world, but it's a lot better than what's coming down the pike now, that what started after the coup. So it is very troubling for uh, the world's climate because most of the oxygen, a big portion of the world's oxygen comes from these trees in the Amazon jungle. And it also contains 14% of the world's fresh water, which is going to dry up if they cut everything down. Brian, thanks again for being on the show. I really appreciate it. I really appreciate you doing a, this live streaming podcast with us. Uh, thanks so much, and we'll be talking to you soon. Uh, stay safe and be well, my friend. Okay, can I just say one last thing really quick? Uh, all, right. all right. I'm going to be covering the anti-Bolsonaro protest tonight on Telesur English and Telesur uh, Spanish. Just filming. I'm not going to be speaking but it might be interesting to tune into. And I made a joke about Telesur earlier being the Venezuelans, but just to be clear, <laughs> Telesur is a public television station that was created as a socialist alternative to CNN, which is funded by the governments of Cuba, Nicaragua, Bolivia, and Venezuela. 
So thanks a lot. Yeah, and uh, just wanted to make sure that people understood your sarcasm there. I appreciate that, Brian. Yeah. All right, take care, yeah. man. All right, see you later. Thanks, Brian. That is our correspondent in Sao Paulo, Brazil, Brian Mir, author of Voices of the Brazilian Left, a collection of interviews with Brazil's left who are rarely, if ever, interviewed by, let alone mentioned in the northern media. Brian is an editor at Brazil Wire and a freelance writer and a producer. Brian also has his own weekly web TV show in Brazil for some big lefty news medium called Brazil 24-7. As, as he was just saying, today, Tuesday, Tuesday? Yes, it's Tuesday, right? October 30th. Hey, it's Devil's Night. Uh, he will be doing uh, covering the anti-Bolsonaro actions. And you can see that at Telesur English and Telesur Spanish. Thank you for listening to This Is Hell. For more interview hell and to support the show, visit thisishell.com. <laughs>